5. Job chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to get one verse here, then go to the New Testament. All right, let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We pray tonight that you give us a blessing out of thy word. I thank you for everyone who came out. I pray that they would get a, a blessing for being here and uh, be with the kids also. Let them learn a lot in Sunday school. And I pray that all things would be done to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, now, Job chapter 5 and verse number 13. Now, one thing I want you to look at here is, these are not the words, now this is the word of God, okay? And God, this is God's word. But when you think about God's word, God's word has the words of people. It's God's word. Sometimes he spoke directly, but God also has the words of Satan. And go figure, it's God's word, but he lets Satan have a voice in it. God also has the words of wicked people in the Bible. Okay, Jezebel, for one, her words are recorded. Ahab, his words are recorded. Uh, there are others that said things that weren't really totally true. Okay, um, a lot that the devil spoke was a half truth, but the Lord recorded it, and it's part of God's word. Here in Job, in chapter 5, if you look in chapter 4, verse 1, you're going to see Eliphaz, the Temanite. Now, Job's three friends that came to him, they came to comfort him. And when they first saw Job, no one said a word for seven days and seven nights. And finally, Job opens up his his mouth in chapter 3, and he curses his day. It's very negative at the beginning. Job actually curses the day in, that he was born, and he wishes that the womb that brought him forth, he would have perished before he ever came out. Uh, that's how bad his life had gotten. And then you get to chapter 4, and Eliphaz begins to record, his words are recorded. Now, there's Job's three friends, and not all that they say are good things about Job, okay? But as God would have it, he let their words be penned. And some of their words were pointed right at Job, okay? Now, I read a verse last night, and Paul quotes it. And it's strange how Paul would quote not the words of God from the Old Testament. And Paul didn't quote here the words of Isaiah, a reputable prophet, or the words of Jeremiah. But Job chooses to quote Eliphaz. Okay. And again, when they were talking to Job, a lot that they said was not right and not good. And a lot of it was not truthful about Job. So what I'm saying is that sometimes in the word of God and God gave everybody an opportunity to speak, he wrote these things down. And those in the New Testament, like Paul, had their words at his disposal. So he could read it just like we could read it, the Old Testament. And then Joe, uh, Paul, as he began to pen the New Testament, took some things from the old and wrote them down. And the verse that I want to go to is Job chapter 5 and verse 13. I got a blessing out of this last night. I was reading my Bible, and I noticed this verse, and I knew that Paul had quoted this in the New Testament, but I never realized it came from Eliphaz, the Temanite. It says in verse 13 of chapter 5, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Now, I want to take the first part of that. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Now, there's been a lot of talk, and I know, again, I, I was talking to Tom, and I was talking to um, Justin last week. We were talking about the, the situation of the world and how it angers us and how it frustrates us. And when you hear all of the stuff that comes out, on the news media, and, and, and from that, it tends to get you frustrated because it grieves your spirit. There's something about it that's just not righteous. There's something about it that is not godly. There's something about it that's very earthy, very carnal, very worldly. It's sensual. It's devilish. It's things that, that just when you read it, you know it's not right, and you get frustrated. And in the case of uh, Justin, he told me, he said, Pastor, it makes me downright angry. This is worldly wisdom at its best, okay? 
what we're dealing with is in the world today, we're dealing with earthly wisdom and we're dealing with the wisdom of this world. And we're dealing with people who have left the wisdom of God and that now are focusing on the wisdom of man. It's boiling down to a point where God's spirit is not getting the worship. Man is left off worshiping God's spirit and is now worshiping man's spirit. Okay. And this is where this is all heading and where this all heads. And he says it here. Job is, Job is the oldest written book in the history of the world. Okay. It's the oldest written book of any books of the Bible dating wise. Okay. It was written before, not the, not the, not the things that happened within Job, but the time of the writing, Job was the first book written, okay? So in the first book penned, we have this verse, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, okay? Now, Ben's been teaching on the gates and the doors and those portals and things like that. And he talked, he talked about the Tower of Babel. Wasn't man becoming wise? And wasn't the idea that we're gonna become like God and the idea that if we can't, in order to become like God, we need to get up to where God is. And they built a tower that reached to heaven. And in their wisdom, what did God do? He confounded them. Okay? He took the wise in their own craftiness. He just changed their language. And this is how simple God can confound man. Just like that. He didn't strike down that tower with a bolt of lightning, which he could have. He didn't send a huge wind and knocked it over. He didn't kill everybody who was building it. God just kind of did a snap of the finger and he said, building has to cease. So you're going to speak this language. 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 And before they knew it, no one could communicate and they had to leave off the building and they all went their separate ways. And basically all God did was that. He just kind of flicked the switch. You all speak a different language. The power of God is absolutely amazing when it comes to the so-called wisdom of man. And as the verse says, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Man gets crafty. He thinks he can outsmart God. He thinks he can outwit God. Can't do it, but he's trying. He's trying Let's go over and we'll look at some of these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Stick in the book and stay by the book. You can't go wrong when you put the book first. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When I talk about the book, I'm talking about the Bible, the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 3. And here's where Paul quotes it in the New Testament. And let's look in verse number 18. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world. Okay, we're talking about worldly wisdom. Wise in this world. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. So what does God do? God tells us to reject the wisdom of the world. God tells us to push it away. Don't accept the wisdom of the world, but become a fool when it comes to worldly wisdom. Because the wisdom that we need is not the wisdom of the earth or the world or man's wisdom. We need the wisdom of God. Amen. And then he says here, he says uh, in verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Where was that written? <clears throat> Book of Job. Eliphaz said that. Okay, we just read that. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. That's what I liked about Paul when I read Paul. He had a great command of the Bible, of the Old Testament. He knew it. And that's how it should be with us when we speak the verses of the Bible should come front and center as we're speaking. When somebody says something, we ought to be able to answer with a scripture or some scripture in the back of our mind ought to pop out and we ought to know that Bible. It should be our goal to know the Bible and to get the wisdom of God. In verse 20, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, 
that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. And as I said at the beginning, what's happening is we're having a lot of what is called will worship and the worship of the human spirit. The human spirit, you know, the world will say the human spirit can prevail. The human spirit will prevail above all. Man will find a way. What's God say? Let no man glory in men. Our glorying tonight is not in man. My glorying as I'm preaching is not in man. Man's wisdom is not the reason I'm up here. I'm up here because of God's wisdom. I'm up here because I glory in the Lord. And that's what he says here. He says, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ and Christ is, and Christ is God's. So our focus should be on God, should be on Christ, not on the worldly wisdom and on the wisdom of man. Okay, now there's a lot more when it comes to wisdom in the Bible, worldly wisdom, and a lot more God says about this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, just a, a couple books back, or ch chapters back, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look in verse number 17. Why was Paul sent, and why is any preacher sent? First. Oh, no, stink bug on me. Did I get it? Okay. I thought something was flying around up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter one. You never know what partners you're going to get in the pulpit. So in this case, I got a stink bug. Okay. That's what God thinks of man's wisdom. Thinks it's stinky. That's a good, good illustration. There. He does. And, and that's the truth. God, God's not impressed. He's not impressed. And when, when we get our eyes on the things of this world and get our eyes and say, look how great man is. And, and, you know, I give man credit in some things, some of the inventions that they made. And when I, when I go out the moon and, and I drive, uh, one, one day uh, my wife and I said, I want to show you this little spot. And we went down on the road and pulled over. And she said, what? There are other cars pulled over. She said, why am I here? I said, just wait. And within about five minutes, an airplane, whoosh, come over, you know. You can look up and see, the, anybody know where I'm talking about? You could see the whole base of the airplane. It's like, oh, man. I mean, to me, that's impressive. You could have 300 people on that airplane, and that airplane just came, descended from maybe 40,000 feet in the air, maybe even higher. And here it comes, and it's going to land. That's pretty impressive. You know, and then we look and we say, oh, look what man did. Wow, isn't man wonderful? And God says, Come on. You know, the Bible says that God, okay, and I'm going I'm to quote this verse. God actually humbles himself. Listen to this. God actually humbles himself to behold the things that are done here on earth. Okay? It's humbling to God. This is how great God is. The Bible says about God that he humbles himself to behold the things done here on earth. Like to me, I look at that plane and I go, oh, wow. And God looks down and it's humbling to him to look down to behold what man has done. That's how great God is. So when we compare God's wisdom to man's wisdom, God's knowledge to man's knowledge, man gets puffed up. But boy, if man would compare himself to God, what would it do to man? What happens when you compare yourself to God? All of a sudden, you begin to see how frail and small you are, right? And like King David, he was like, Lord, why do you even behold us? What is man? Did he say, what is man that thou art what? Mindful of him. What is man? And that was coming from King David. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Okay, let's. I, I enjoyed this study. These verses really, really tie in nicely. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. You see, you didn't come here tonight to hear from Pastor Kevin, did you? You came here tonight to hear what God had to say, and I'm trying to give it to you. Not with the wisdom of word, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should should be made of none effect. And that's what's happening in pulpits across our nation. 
and across this world. Men are getting up and women are getting up and preaching in pulpits, and they're not offering the Word of God. This isn't being preached. This is a closed book to so many Christians and so many pastors. I mean, there are preachers who get in and, 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 and priests who get in a, in a pulpit and never once read, read the Scripture, not one time, and deliver a so-called sermon. It didn't come from God. It came from their own thoughts. You know, it's not up to me. I don't get up here and preach my wisdom. That wouldn't make you any good, would it? You've got to preach the wisdom of God and preach Christ Jesus and the cross, especially. The cross is what changes people's lives. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They hear the preaching of the cross and people, are, that's foolish. Isn't the preaching of the cross what saved us? To the to the, uh, to the world, it's foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And then goes on to say, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have you ever met one of them? You ever met a disputer of this world? They can spit out so many facts about the world, and they can spit out so many facts about this. Atheists are good with this. They're very they're so caught up in themselves, so caught up in their own wisdom, so caught up in, in their own knowledge. They know it all. They're going to prove to you that God doesn't exist. And they'll, and Ben, you've had, Ben's had a lot of interaction with atheists, and he said, Pastor, a lot of them will throw Scripture out. A lot of them will quote the Bible to you. A lot of them will take your own Bible and, and they'll manipulate it. A lot of them will take the Bible and they'll try to disprove it. And they go to no end. What's that? Still there? There it is. Okay. I preached on flies. Maybe I need to preach on stink bugs next. Okay. Um, so it, they're just so good with bringing out facts and trying to disprove the Word of God and disprove you. and. God says, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, look, the world by wisdom, and we're talking about man's wisdom, earthly, worldly wisdom, okay? The world by wisdom knew not God. You think if a person was wise, they would know God, but Again, there's heavenly and spiritual wisdom, and there's earthly and man's type of wisdom. And this type of wisdom doesn't lead to a knowledge of God. Man's wisdom, and the saying is, and I wrote it down, education without salvation is, anybody know the end? Damnation. It's a good saying. Education without salvation is damnation. And the Bible says, in the latter days, knowledge shall be increased. And don't people know more now than they've ever known? I'll tell you right now, with this thing, there isn't anything you can't find out. I ask it the weirdest, strangest question, and you're going to find the answer. I mean, you can find anything you want to know by just plugging it into your cell phone and doing a search on it, and it'll give you all the wisdom you want to know. And you could become a fluffy head and get all this knowledge and all of this wisdom, and no matter how much you know, it won't help you know God. This is the only thing that's going to help you know God, the Word of God. And man says... Well, the wisdom of God and the Word of God, they push this away. Give me this. Give me that. Give me the world. Give me this. Give me more knowledge. Give me more. Oh, this, this subject and that subject. And, and, and feed me. Feed, and it's just knowledge in knowledge, 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 but no knowledge of God. The world by wisdom knew not God. So how do you get to know God? Tonight, you're doing a great job by sitting in your seat because you get to know God by listening to godly preaching, okay? So it says in verse number 20 again, 
where is the disputer of the world of this world hath not god made foolish the wisdom of this world for after that in the wisdom of god the world by wisdom knew not god it pleased god by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe you see the world says you're going to church again why well, that's stupid that's foolish go to church man 10 minutes to preach i'm done what do you mean you go to church on sunday somebody said to me how many times you go to church in a week i go to church three times sunday and i go to church on wednesday and then you go to church how many times i don't know anybody goes to church like that why do you go to church so much we go to church because we want to know about the wisdom of God and we want to hear the preaching. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So though the world looks on this as foolishness, you see, the things of God, foolishness to man. The things of man, foolishness to God. So man has to make a choice. Do I want the things of man or do I want the things of God? Tonight, because you're saved, you want the things of God. I mean, there's not a person in here who doesn't want to grow in the Lord. Amen. Everybody wants to grow more in God. That's why you're here. And you're paying attention and you're listening because you say, okay, pastor, I'm getting this. Less of the world, less of man's wisdom, less of the news media outlets, less of the paper, less of man's knowledge and all the things here. I need to be more heavenly minded. I need more of God. I need more of God's word. I need more of preaching. And when you get this, now you're getting God's wisdom. And with that comes God's blessings. Where does all this lead? Where does all man's wisdom lead to? And where does all the head of knowledge lead to? Again, remember the saying, education without salvation is damnation. And I'll show you where it leads. Okay, let's look. It says in verse 22, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Jews need a sign and the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. Paul had that trouble in his day. He had that trouble with the Grecians. He had that trouble with the Jews. Okay, so, you know, you think about today, it's no different. The heart of man is no different than it was in the day of Paul. No different. Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block because they don't believe that he was the Messiah or the Savior. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. So he said when he preached Christ crucified to the Greeks, it was foolishness. 24, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. I, and this, this verse is amazing. I didn't know God could have any foolishness. I almost read this reverently because to apply foolishness to God is, is crazy. But it says, Paul said this, because the foolishness of God, okay? Now you might look at that and shake your head and say, God has foolishness? What Paul's saying is foolishness of God, the weakness of God, if there is any, is still so much stronger than man. And that's what he's saying here in 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. That's why a lot of wise men, and I say this and I quote, great men are not always wise. I quote that all the time. Wise men, according to the flesh. Not many of them, okay, it says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Queen Victoria and Pastor Jim always used to say this. This is how I knew this. Not many noble. She said, I thank God for the N on noble. Or I thank God for the M on many. I'm sorry. I thank God for the M on many. Because if you didn't have the M on many, it would say not any noble because Queen Victoria knew God. <clears throat> so she thanked God for that M. And I always got a chuckle out of that. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Look at 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty 
and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And I'll tell you, this is why a lot of preachers come from bad backgrounds. I am kind of the exception to the rule when it comes to preachers. I didn't come from a bad background. I was saved at a young age. You know, you know me, you know my dad and how I was raised. I was raised as a to be a wholesome young man. I didn't get into trouble. I didn't do drugs. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't, I didn't run around with you know crowds I shouldn't run around with. I always tried to stay out of trouble. I never was in jail. I never been arrested. I mean, I, I, I can't say that I've had a life that has been involved in a lot of bad dealings. That's probably why I shouldn't be a preacher because I go against the rule. How many of our missionaries give testimonies that they were raised in church? Not many. Most of the missionaries, most of the, especially evangelists, evangelists, almost all of them come from bad, horrific backgrounds. They were in jail. They were street fighters. They were strung out on drugs. How many of them do you know? And to the world, they say, and they're a preacher now? What God does is he takes the base things of the world and he takes the things that confound man's wisdom and he uses sometimes the lowest people. And I don't say I'm any better. I'm not any better. I just, I wasn't involved in a lot of that stuff, you know, as grown up. Everybody comes from different backgrounds. But God called me to preach and he can use anyone. And God is basically saying, and a lot of times, even with Paul, wasn't Paul before he got converted? What was he? What did he say he was? He was a murderer. God used a murderer to write 13 epistles. Maybe the greatest Christian who ever lived murdered somebody. God, and, and, and Paul knew about those things, the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. And again, just because I said those things about myself doesn't make me any better because I can't glory in God's presence because all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And no matter what I've done before I was saved, it was a filthy rag, it was no good. And God saved me, he gave me something to live for and put his spirit in me and called me. So my flesh can't glory in his presence either. That no flesh should glory in his presence, okay? But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. To most people, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ is a swear word. To most people. That's what it is. The only time Jesus Christ is ever, ever falling off that word, that name is ever coming off of their lips is when they're swearing. That's what the world thinks of Jesus Christ. He finds his way into movies. You know, you never never hear them cuss on Harry Krishna. You never hear somebody say, ah, Confucius. You never hear somebody say, ah, oh, Muhammad. You never hear anybody cuss on those names. You never hear anybody cuss and say, ah, oh, this religious leader or that religious leader. They don't do it. They cuss on Jesus Christ. You know why they do that? Because there's power in that name. They don't realize how much power is in that name. But I tell you what, when you, when you find out who Christ is and you accept him for who he was and his spirit comes into you, you realize Jesus Christ is almighty God. You get the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of God comes with it. Verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, the superstition... The worship of the human spirit and not of God's spirit. Again, we're facing that today because the word of God is not being preached. And where the word of God is preached, that fades away. And where the word of God is not preached and accepted, this begins to rear its ugly head again. And we're seeing it in the world. And it's frustrating to us as Christians because we say, what happened to the days of all the godliness? 
And now we're seeing all this ungodliness popping up. All it is is what was in the book of Acts. When Paul started out, this is the way the world was. And he tells us that in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul had the same problem. And what will change it is preaching the word of God. Acts chapter 17. What did the Greeks, to them, the preaching of Christ was foolishness to them, okay? Because the Greeks seek after wisdom. So if the Greeks seek after wisdom, they must be pretty wise. Surely they'd be a godly bunch, wouldn't they? What's the capital of Greece? Athens, okay? Athens, capital, uh, Rome is, oh, that's all right. But it's, it's at, it, Rome is in Italy. Athens, we got Greece, okay? So we got Athens, and here we got Athens. So Paul's standing in Athens, and what happens to him? Acts 17, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So if they were so wise, why were they worshiping dumb idols? Because that's what God calls idols, dumb idols the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers, don't we have a lot of them today? Amen. Certain philosophers of the Epicureans, Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, I get a chuckle out of this, what will this babbler say? Others some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Aragopolis, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? And I tell you, Christianity is becoming a doctrine that's not familiar with people anymore. They don't know much about it anymore. And it's one day going to be a new doctrine to everybody because it's not going to be preached. So when you get frustrated and you think about the world situation, you can blame it on the pulpits because they have left off preaching the truth. And when you leave off preaching the truth, people become heathen, pagan, idolatries, okay? Idolaters. It says in verse number 20, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians, and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. See, they wanted to get knowledge. Tell us something new we don't know. They prided themselves. They were proud of their wisdom, the Greeks. 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. I could just see the boiling point here. Okay? All of a sudden, it's smoke starting to come out of his ears, and Paul's had it. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said... Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. You can hear it. He's just at his wit's end. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. This is what the world said, the unknown God. Who is he? Do we know who he is? Who is he? Jesus Christ. Paul's saying to the unknown God, you don't even know who it is. What did Jesus say to the woman at the well? He said, we know what we worship. He said, you don't know what you worship. We know what we worship. Okay? It says, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven, and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. 
He's basically telling them, look around. He's so close. He's not very far from you. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said. For we are also, we are also, are, uh, we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And I got to read this one too, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Okay, now, where else in the Bible should I go? Where else in the Bible should I go? What happens when man pushes off God and man worships himself? Okay, let's think about the climate of today. What is happening to the world? What is happening to the world? Now, what did I preach? God's wisdom, God, knowledge of God, God's word, God's spirit, man's wisdom, okay, knowledge of man, knowledge of earthly things, man's spirit. God says, choose my spirit my ways, my word, and blessings from me come upon that. If you choose this stuff, my curses fall upon this. So when man goes after his own wisdom and man begins to worship his own will and himself and makes himself a God, what in the end happens to man? How about this? Good, evil. God begins to, as he did in the, in the Tower of Babel, he begins to confuse the mind of man so that man's wisdom confounds him and God makes foolish the wisdom of man by man going after himself instead of God. And in the end, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... Where am I going? Romans 1. Romans 1. We have man turning into a reprobate. Reprobate. Okay. Uh, I don't have time for all this tonight, I don't think. But I really had some fantastic verses in Isaiah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let's, let's just look at Romans 1 real quick, and then I'm going to jump over to Isaiah, because you got to see these verses in Isaiah. They're really good. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. It says in verse 18, Romans 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And that's where man's holding the truth right now. And man doesn't even believe in absolute truth anymore. He believes everything to be relative. Hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish, see, foolish, to them they're wise, God says their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So they begin to worship not God, they worship the world. They worship animals. They worship the creation. And this is where we're seeing it's becoming a worship of heathenism, paganism, things in the world. They're worshiping things that are visible instead of things that are not visible. 
and God's saying they're becoming foolish and God's turning them over to things like this. Now, watch where this goes. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So because they're worshiping the creature and not the creator, God in verse 26 for this cause God gave them up unto vow affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men. Is that today? This was written how long ago? And Paul said what would happen when these things occur. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And the reason they're doing this is because of verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then you can read the rest of the chapter later. But I want to close this out with Isaiah 29. Isaiah chapter 29. This is where man's wisdom will get you. You want to be freed from it? Go to God and get his wisdom. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. Okay, Isaiah 29 and verse 9. I'm going to read down to verse 16. Okay, bear with me. Isaiah 29 verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. Everyone there? Everyone there? Okay, let's go uh, um, follow along. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Why? Why are they doing that? It's not because of wine. It's not because of strong drink. Why are they staggering? Why are they having trouble? For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes that the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. See? This is sealed to them. It says the words of a book that are sealed. Nobody understands it. And look. The vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me, near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Look, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. Okay? They seek deep to hide their own counsel from the Lord. They don't, they, they don't want him to see. Okay? Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Surely you're turning of things upside down. There it is. Good, evil, turning, your turning of things upside down. What have they done? Let's say this bottle, good, evil. What they've done is your turning of things upside down. What is good today? What is evil? What is normal? What is a gender? 
I don't want to be called Mr. I want to be called they. I want to be called it. Oh, we laugh. This is what they're offering in colleges. What would you like to be called? Oh, he, it's completely flipped. Why? Because man's wisdom is prevailing over God's wisdom. And God is saying, you want it that way? I'll just confuse your brain. I'll confuse you so much you won't know what right and what wrong is. But when you have the word of God instilled in you, you know right and wrong. And this is frustrating to you, is it not? Because the word of God is so ingrained and entrenched in you that you know this to be truth. And when you see things around you happening, you say, is somebody going to see how crazy this is? Surely everybody else thinks like I do. But no one else does. Because this is a closed and hidden book to them. The same book that gave you the conscience towards God, they don't have it. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. How may deny God? An atheist will not say God made him. What's, it, what's God say? For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. Here it is. The vessel. The being, the person, the man, who made you? Let's just say this is a man. Who made you, sir? Nobody. I just became. They won't give credit to the maker. Is this preaching a reality today? You better believe it. It's all around us. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it? He hath no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Amen. I just praise God that no matter how far the world goes with this that Christ is coming back one day and he's going to change all of this you know and that's what I'm saying if you're down and you're frustrated over the current situation of the world you're not alone but it's during these times that we say Christ coming has to be close because how much farther is God going to let this go before God steps in and say enough is enough how much farther Okay.